So how many of you have seen the movie Princess Bride? Really? Only? Okay, let's try this again, because I think you were sleeping. How many of you have seen the movie Princess Bride? All right. If you've seen it and the person next to you didn't raise their hand, just look at them and go, really? Come on. All right. So, you know, it's funny when we watch a video like that, we tend to think of love as this romantic, only romantic thing. And the truth is, lasting love has very specific things. And here's what's really cool. We've been talking about 1 Corinthians 13. And today we're going to look at one verse. And we, the, the first verses talk in general. And then this verse gives you four specific things that you and I can do to be more loving. This is true whether you're in a romantic relationship or, just listen, as church members with each other. If you get to know each other, you're going to have to apply these things. If you want to be loving at work, in your workplace, these four things will help you to be loving and they'll help love to last. And here they are. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says this. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Those are the four things we're going to talk about today. But first, before I do that, here's what I want to say, because um, I just want to demonstrate something, especially to our youngins that are here today. How many of you, who in here, you've been married over 10 years? By the way, if your spouse has passed away, you still count, okay? How many of you are or were married over 10 years? You were married over 10 years? All right. All right. I see those hands. I see those hands. All right. How about 20 years? 20 years? We've got some 20, a lot of 20 years in here. 30 years. You've been married over 30 years. Give those people a hand for the 30. All right, over 40 years, over 40 years. By the way, um, Neil and his wife are celebrating their 20th anniversary this week. And yeah, so that's awesome. And we pray for Julie every day. Anybody in here over 50 years, married over 50 years? I see a couple of hands. That's all the way in the back there. Now, here's what I want to show you. And the response was overwhelming. It was always easy, right? (laughs) <laughs> this, I like this response better. You didn't yell no. Last service yelled no at me. You guys just laughed. It was always easy, right? <laughs> right, maybe because your spouse is sitting next to you. The truth is, listen, if you're going to be married any length of time, if you're going to be, listen, not just marriage, if you're going to be in any relationship with anyone, if you want to love people like Christ loves people, you, you and I have to learn how to love because it, it, listen, having a relationship with anyone is difficult. We say hurtful things to each other. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. By the way, there's people who go from church to church looking for the perfect church. So let me just, let me just clue you in. If you're here today and you're looking for the perfect church, you're in the wrong place. If you, if you, now, now, this is a perfect church for imperfect people. But this is not a perfect... And if you're here today and you're perfect... Do not join our church. You will raise the bar, and we just can't handle you, okay? So there's another church that thinks they're perfect, and we'll send you there, okay? Now, when I was, uh, a couple weeks ago, when I went with the youth, we went whitewater rafting. And I got to thinking about relationships and whitewater rafting. A few years ago, I took a college group whitewater rafting, and when we went whitewater rafting, we were headed down the river, and one of the rafting guides had his... Uh, group in a hydraulic. A hydraulic is where the water comes behind a rock and it spins in the river. You've seen it. And what happens is if you can get your whole group to basically go upstream against the current, they can paddle into that and then your guide can do something called surfing. Now surfing is really cool because you get your raft there and the guide can actually dip the nose. A good guide can dip the nose of the raft Fill the raft with water, which doesn't sound fun to some of you, I know, but it's really cool. And you can actually kind of feel it. It feels like surfing. Well, as we were coming down the river, this other guy, and I had a whole college group. It was my first college trip with this group. So I had about five college students in the raft with me. And as we went down the river, we went to paddle. And when we went to paddle, he said stroke, and the left side did not hear that. And so I was on the right. And we went, and the rough spun, and the guide couldn't control it. And we bumped into the guy, and we knocked them out of the hydraulic, out of the surfing. Their guide was furious. He must have been having a great time. That's all I can figure, because he began swinging his paddle at our guide, trying to knock him out of our raft, which, by the way, is not a good thing on the rapids. 
It would be like if somebody's mountain biking and you say, I'm taking your helmet. I mean, you just don't, right? So this is the guy, he's swinging his paddle. Then he grabs hold of our raft. Now back at this time, rafts were filled with just one. Now they have several plugs, but they had one plug in the front. He reached over and he unscrewed the plug for our raft and was letting the air out of our raft. To which the student sitting in the front, which was one of the smartest girls I knew, I had taught her years before, she put her hand over the hole trying to stop the air. I don't know if you've ever tried that with something this big. So the guide, our guide left where he was, came forward and did that, but the, but the air was deflated. So as, as we went down the river, he then began swinging his paddle at the, and they were having a fight. And they were, listen, I grew up in a home with a construction. My dad was, ran a construction company. And I learned new ways to string cuss words together that day. I had never discovered before. I thought, you know, I've never thought of that combination when you put those. That really makes that person a totally different description. It was really an unusual combination. But anyway, our guide wanted us to catch him so he could kill him. We were like, okay, we're paddling. And we got stuck on a rock. I was in the middle, and the boat bent this way, backwards, like reverse taco. And I was up out of the water like four feet, and the people in the thing, were, the water was flying in. And it was awesome. We finally got off the rock. Now, here's what I want to talk about. In relationships... Whether it's on purpose or accident, if you're in a relationship with anyone, you will bump into them because it's two humans and neither one of you are perfect. And so there'll be times where even at work or if you work with somebody long enough or you know, if you put up with the pastor long enough or if you, you know, whatever it is, when you have a relationship with somebody, regardless of how wonderful you think, they're just wonderful. They're just, you're, oh, they're perfect. Couples come in for premarital counseling. I just think he's perfect. <laughs> I mean, yes, I, I agree with you. Tell me about him. Oh, he's so funny. You like that now, huh? <laughs> See you in five years, right? <laughs> I'm so tired of him trying to be funny, right? And I don't know why all of a sudden her voice got deeper. But anyway, so <laughs> we're human. So we bump into each other. But we overreact. And we hurt each other worse. When you bump into somebody, you have options at that point. You're going to bump. Listen, if you're married any length of time, you will bump into. Can the people who have been married a long time testify to this bumping that occurs? Sometimes. Amen. 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 That, was, that was a little too loud. You're now in trouble. Now, now let me tell you what happens in relationship. If you're really going to love people, you have to learn to be unselfish. We have to learn that from Christ. You know, church should be the most loving place. Don't you agree? But, but as a pastor, can I be honest with you? It's easy for me to be selfish. It's easy for me to say, I wish everyone would just behave. I have children. I say the same thing. Can't everybody just get along? You know, uh, you, just, you want people to just do... And here's the deal. Can we love people when they don't do what we want? Everybody loves the pastor when he says yes to them. They come and they have a request. Hey, can you help me with this? Can I do this? Can I do this in church? Can I try this out? Yes. It's when I say no that I discover whether they really are loving or not. Whether they really, oh, pastor, we just think you're great. Yeah, wait till I say no. Pastor, I love you as long as you don't offend me. As long as you don't preach something I don't like or you preach what I want you to preach, then as long as you behave the way I want you to. And we do that in relationships. And here's the deal. If we're going to be a church that grows and honors God, we have to give up our selfishness. We have to sing some songs that we don't like. You want a church to grow, you sing a song that you don't like. You go, oh, I'll fly away. Here it is again. I, I'm going to fly away next time I see that. Really? A banjo? Do we have to have a band? Right? Right? And some of you, but see, others of you, and I'm telling you, it happens to me all the time. There's a song that we sing and we've sung, and I love the song. And it's such a good, good father that we have. And, 
But after I sung it 400 times, I'm like, oh, I can't sing it one more time. And I'm telling you, I'm thinking it, and I sing it. I say, Lord, you know, you are a good father. And, and Lord, please, let's not sing that for another month. But Jesus said, uh, right? And then one of you comes up and goes, you know, during that song, God just spoke to me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> he spoke to me too, right? Now, so what's the deal? Hey, we have to learn to be unselfish. Church can't be just for your age group. Church can't just be for your demographic. Church can't be based on color or creed or who you are. Listen, we've got to be on self. And if we are, we won't be able to stop this church from growing. And all it takes is us learning to love like Christ. But we can only do it with him. Listen, listen to the example he set for us, okay? And 1 Corinthians 13 is all about it. We've been talking about this all month. So today we're going to talk about those four things. We're going to talk about protecting each other. Having faith, having expectation, the good expectation, and enduring. So here's what Jesus did, John 3, 16 and 17 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, that's the idea of putting faith in. It's not just understanding, it's not just this kind of thought, it's a faith. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now here's the key that Christians forget. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. By the lives of most Christians, honestly, we think that God came to condemn. When the woman caught in adultery was thrown before Jesus. By the way, where was the man? I'm just saying. <laughs> adultery. It just shows their prejudice. When he was brought before Jesus, Jesus could have attacked her. But it says he came not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, it wasn't no rules just right. Jesus looked and said, go send no more to her. But he also didn't attack her. We, we don't have a balance. This, this is why, listen, if you want to love like Jesus, you have to spend time with God. You have to spend time in prayer. You have to get your Bible out. But listen, everybody's got it on their phone now. If you don't, Google it. There's Bibles everywhere. We've got more Bibles than ever, and people read them less than they ever have. You spent more time on Facebook this week than the Bible. If you want to fall in love with God, spend time in his word. Listen to what he says about you. And then ask him, Holy Spirit, would you fill me with your love? If you're a Christian, you should say, God, I'm selfish. On my best day, I'm selfish. Your pastor is selfish until he has the love of God. And when God pours his love into my heart, a selfish, self-centered pastor that would tell everybody exactly how they should run their lives is able to love people who don't get it right. And is able to receive love knowing that he doesn't get it right. When you love other people, you're able to put down your desires. Listen to this, John 15. Jesus said this, love each other as I've loved you. How you doing on that one? Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. We can't even lay down our music styles in churches. We can't lay down the color of the carpet that we pick. We can't lay down whether we get to do something or we don't get to do something in church. We... I can't even drive down the street and have somebody cut me off. I want to lay down their life. <laughs> right? So we got a long way to go on this one, don't we? But how do we overcome that? We say, God, would you help me to love like you love? Help me to desire to be a blessing. I'll never forget, I visited uh, Willow Creek Church out in, in uh, uh, Chicago, outside of Chicago. And when we were there, I found some things out later. They had like restaurants where they charge just basically what it costs. But it's all manned by people who volunteer, who we don't call them volunteers, we call them servants. Because <laughs> when you're commanded by God, you don't get to volunteer. But anyway, so, so they're serving, and there were guys wiping tables. And of course, you know, there's people that go there. So those people are messy, and they leave mess, and they don't pick up their stuff. And by the way, all the money that they did make went to missions that they had. And so anyway, that's another story. But they were wiping tables, and I saw these men wiping tables, and it just seemed odd. And I thought, this guy doesn't look like the normal table wiper. And as I was talking to one of the leaders, I found out in the church, some of the guys who wipe tables and mop floors there work in Sears Tower as CEOs of huge corporations. They could hire people to do the work, but they want to be a servant because they know Jesus 
who is God, came to serve. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. They said that's more significant to those men than all of the corporate millions of dollars that they're making, that they take time to serve. If we're going to be a church that loves and cares about people, we have to give our own selfishness up and self-centeredness up. And the truth is, if you and I are going to love anyone, we can't be selfish. We have to care. And we have to care about them. So let's talk about this idea and four things that we can do. Now, here's what I want you to know. Love is not a feeling. You ever been in the mall and some parent says to their kid, quit crying, be happy. <laughs> Unless they have some special shot or laughing gas, right? That's not happening because that's an emotion. You can't suddenly, don't you wish some days, have you ever just woken up sad? And you think, be happy, <laughs> and your body goes, no. <laughs> In the Bible, over and over, we're commanded to love. You know why? Because it's a choice. So here's four choices that you can make that will help you to love. Number one, lasting love extends grace. Christians should be the most gracious people on earth. Love always protects. That means patiently accepts all things. It means it's ready to make allowances. In the Greek, this word, stego, means to put a roof over. So this is one that, that's read in weddings. And so when I do a wedding, it's the idea of protecting someone. And this is so important with social media today. If somebody makes you mad, you can tell everyone. Literally everyone. But if you love people, you try to protect them. That's why when somebody makes a mistake, you're supposed to go to the first. You only make the mistake as public as the offense, not more public. So you don't stand up in church and say, you know, so-and-so. We protect each other. And in a marriage, you protect each other. You don't start making a list. By the way, as soon as you start making a list, you can realize it's selfishness. Only Santa does a list. But he's checking it twice. It's okay. Ephesians 4, always be humble, gentle, and patient. How are you doing with that one? Accepting each other in love. You're joined together with peace through the Spirit. Listen to this. So make, listen to these next two words. Every effort. You know what that means? This is talking about the early church. It means that you can try. It means that the Holy Spirit can give you power to do this, to continue together in this way. Basically, God, would you through your Spirit... Give me peace so I can get along with that person that's hard to get along with. See, a church can become a business like anything else. A marriage can become a business like anything else. Your relationships at work can be about you using other people. Or you can learn to really love people. You can really learn to look at them unselfishly. Now listen, there are boundaries, and we're going to talk about that at the end of next month. We're starting a new series called Boundaries. You won't want to miss it. It's how can you love people but have good boundaries for them at the same time. But we have to start with our heart motivation. Do I really have grace when, when people fail? When, listen, when you get around people, you know what's going to happen? They're going to irritate you. When, when you get around people, th their words or their actions are going to hurt you. Our poor presentation team, almost every week I look up, oh, come on. What's, can, we do the, can we do the slides before we start singing them, right? And Lord, I lift your, your name on high, right? Because we... So you get around people and you go, I'm sorry. Sometimes people sin. These people have been married 20, 30 years. Can I tell you what that is? It's two really good forgivers. Because just nobody's... They don't have it together. You have to forgive each other. We're going to skip to the bottom of this next one. I want to show you what Jesus says here. While I was with them, Jesus said, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. If you love people, you want them to feel safe. And too often, the church is the group that attacks people. And too often, our marriages we're not protecting each other. We're attacking each other. We're telling each other what we've done wrong. We're making a list. Can you imagine on the wedding day if that's what I did? I stood a couple up and I said, okay, everyone, I want to tell you what their lists are. 
He said, I'm talking to the bride. She's on this side, by the way. He said that um, you have to give him the remote when he asks. No, no, just all the time. It doesn't even say ask here. So, yeah, you don't get the remote. And you will cook good meals. And you'll never nag. <laughs> your list is you'll pick up your socks. You'll help wash dishes. You'll have a real job. <laughs> now, why did I do that on a wedding day? Because that's not love. So why do couples start it as soon as they get married? They got married and they just loved each other and then they started a list. What in the world? I don't have a list for you. It happens in churches. Listen, I go to pastor's meetings. We, we can be as selfish as anybody else. That good-looking pastor on TV, hey, how's it going? They, we, we can be as doofy as everybody. You come to my small group, I'll tell you right now, you come to my small group the first week, you'll leave. Oh, that Eric, he's so spiritual. You should te hear him teach the Bible. He's so, he's brilliant. He's so smart. Week two, can you believe he said that? I... <laughs> week three, we really need to pray about a different pastor. Because <laughs> you get to know people. So what do you do? You cover for them. You, you realize they make mistakes. So let me ask you this question. Who in your life do you need to extend grace to this week? As the older couple said, there was a lady, and, and she said, I remember when your husband did this. And the wife said, well, I specifically remember forgetting that. <laughs> so is there anything this week that you need to remember to forget? Number two, not only does it extend grace, lasting love expresses faith. Love always trusts. This is the word for faith. That means it never stops believing. Journey had it right. Yeah. Don't stop believing. Boston had it right too. They said don't look back. But Journey had it right. They said don't stop believing. It never loses faith. So what do you expect about those you love? Do you have expectations? They did a study. This, this guy, I call him, I could say that he manipulated people, but this guy named Robert Rosenthal, in 1964, he did a fake IQ test. He even had Harvard covers printed. He went into a normal, regular classroom with normal students. Not high-functioning, not low-functioning, just run-of-the-mill students. This, okay, so they walked in. He gave out IQ tests. When they were done, he chose five students randomly that were average students, and he said to the teacher, these are your five gifted students. Their potential is unbelievable. You won't believe what could happen with them. And they just went on and on. Do you know what they discovered? Those teachers treated those five students totally differently. They, they actually touched them more nodded more, made eye contact with, gave them longer times to answer why. Because that teacher believed that student could do it. And you know what happened? That student excelled. Those, that hand, those handful of students excelled more than the other students. Why? Because somebody put faith in them. Do you do that at your home? Do you just expect somebody to fail all the time? Hey, if you want someone to fail, expect them to fail. Put that on them all the time. Oh, you never get it right. That, by the way, that's what Satan does to you, you know, right? See, God's very specific when he convicts you. God comes to you and he says, you struggle with it. Eric, you know, you, know, you were not nice to your daughter or whatever, okay? Satan comes and goes, you're a terrible dad. Well, I can't do anything about terrible dad. I can do something about saying something dumb. I can go and apologize. Exactly. Bless you. Galatians 5, verse 6 says this, The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through a rules list. No, through love. Through love. See, religious leaders always had their rule book. But the problem was the motivation was wrong. And so if you motivate somebody by rules, they're not really motivated. If on the wedding day, if I said, now here's your rules... But if they love each other, what's going to happen? They're going to want to do what pleases the other person. The same is true of God. If we really help people to fall in love with God, if we really help people to love each other, then we're going to be unselfish. Then we will do what's right with the right motivation. See, the Pharisees did the rules without the love. 
And Jesus said, if you loved him first, then you would do those things naturally. That's why in John 15, 15, before they even messed up, the disciples are getting ready to mess up, and Jesus says, I call you friends. By the way, if I was Jesus, the night of the foot washing, I would have been like, okay, Peter, you're getting ready to mess up. I'm going to wash your feet. Oh, Judas, uh, skip next, right? But he didn't. He washed his feet. And yet we can't give anybody a break. Why don't we start saying what we could see by faith in people? Do you want your wife to treat you like a king, guys? Then treat her like a queen. Don't say, well, when they treat me this way, I'll treat them this way. How about you, by faith, start treating them the right way first? I remember in junior high, I would come home with D's on my report card. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and my mom would get my report card, and here's what she'd say. Now, my mom could have said, now listen. Actually, she's country, so she's like, now listen. She'd say, well, son, I know you can do anything you put your mind to. I'm like, yeah, that's why I wasn't studying, right? So when I got into college, I finally decided to believe my mom. And I said, I'm going to study. And I majored in biology and in education. I got a double major in college. Got my teaching degree. And then I went and took master's degree, got A's and B's all through that. One C. I don't like that teacher. <laughs> then I got my doctorate. Because my mom, from the time I was a child, said, you can do anything you want. Now, if you had met me in sixth grade and looked at my grades, you would have went, get him a shovel. <laughs> He's going to be the best ditch digger ever. But she said, I believe in you. Who is someone? Here's the practical. Who is someone that you need to believe the best about this week? That you need to tell them what you'd like to see or what can happen, the possibilities instead of what's happening now, number three, not only does it extend grace, express faith, lasting love, you ready for this? Expects the best. Love always hopes. I love this. It says always expects the best, never stops hoping. The, in the Greek, this means to anticipate with pleasure, which literally is the idea of dreaming. What's really awesome about that is they did a study very recently of couples who are happy together, which is rare, but anyway, the couples that are happy together, truly happy. And they found that couples are the happiest, plan together, dream together. So it doesn't have to be anything complicated. They may plan a staycation. They may plan a vacation. They look ahead and they begin to plan. Because here's the deal. Listen, when couples come in for premarital counseling, I never have to ask them. So, so are you dreaming about anything? I mean, they tell me. I know one day. We'll be. And they go on. And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Right? But the truth is, the couples that don't stop doing that do better. So if you stop doing that in your home, begin to dream again. It doesn't have to be anything. It can be as simple as planning to have a lunch together. Just, just dream a little. Dream about what could be. It's easy to think about the negative and focus on that, but instead hope. Look for the future. Don't let your dreams die. So if you're ready to give up on somebody, instead, how about dream of what could be and put some things into action by that last point with faith. In Titus 3, 7, it says, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs. Listen, having the hope of eternal life. Christians should be the most hopeful people on earth. You have eternal If you're a Christian, you already have eternal life. You have hope in the future. So how about you begin applying that to your relationships? Maybe you have a boss who's a doofus. Dufasi in the Greek, right? Maybe begin saying, you know, how can I have faith? How can I begin to treat my boss well? And how can I begin to think, how could I make his life better or her life better? What's something that I could do? What's something that we could maybe as a group do together? As a church, we want to dream together. We want to dream of what God can do and how people can serve and how we can impact this community. And the day we quit dreaming and we begin saying, my door, my stuff, my kitchen, my chair, my sound system, my pulpit, my microphone, my... That's the day that we die as a church. 
And when we begin saying, how can I reach the community? How can I help people around the world? How can I be a blessing? And we dream that way. By the way, some of you as couples need to go serve together. They do under the bridge up in Titusville every Monday night where they serve homeless people. You want to feel thankful about your situation? Go up and in the dirt serve people dinner. In the dirt. And they're happy to eat. In the dirt. I don't know the last time you ate in the dirt, but it probably was at the beach. If we serve together and dream together, it makes a difference in how we live. So who is someone you've lost hope in? What's, what's a dream you can have? You know, God, I see this. And then finally, lasting love endures the worst. So it extends grace, expresses faith, expects the best. It endures the worst. I don't want to do this point. Let's go home. Everybody knows this. Love is tough. All of those people who've been married 10, 20, 30. You know, Neil thinks his marriage is easy, but Julie will tell you a different story. 20 years this week, Neil, we clap for you. We love you, but we're still amazed at Julie. You are too, I know. That's why you have a good marriage. Love always perseveres. In the New Living, it says endures through every circumstance. In another version, it says it never gives up. Now, I'm not talking about putting up with abuse, but in America, we give up easy on relationships. You cannot have a long-term relationship and not endure some things because nobody's perfect. They will do things that bother you. They will make mistakes. They'll on purpose or by accident run into you a little bit. But can you endure can you bear under is what that literally means in the Greek. In James 1.12 it says this. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he stood the test he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Everything worth it in life is difficult. The Christian life can be difficult. Following God can be difficult. Staying when things get tough is difficult. And yet God calls us to walk through difficult things. Why? Because it's the difficult things that make us deeper people. I want to encourage you. Maybe you're in your marriage and you're ready to give up. I want to encourage you to begin applying these principles. I want to encourage you to, to press forward when it gets difficult. I want to encourage you, if you want your marriage to be better, apply these things. And begin to say, God, would you help me to be a person of faith? See, the Bible's very practical. It's not a self-help book. It's a life-help book. God gave us instructions. Basic instructions before leaving earth is what people call the Bible. And in 1 Corinthians, this verse 7, it says, listen, protect each other. Have faith in each other. Have expectations for the future. But then also endure when things get tough. Do you want to walk in love? Do those things. The best person in here, the best person in here struggles with selfishness. But that's why we need God. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, the first step to walking in unselfishness and to walking in true love is to receive God's love. So if you've never given your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I've known about Jesus and I've understood him, but I've never really put my faith in him. I've never really trusted him. You can do that today. That's the first step to really living in God's love. But if you're here today and you're a Christian, as I talked about a few of these things, and when Jesus said, love like I love you, you went, uh. <coughs> know that he can do that. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Allow him through the Holy Spirit to fill you with love when you don't feel like being loving. Choose to be loving. If you do that, God will bless you with even more love. And you'll be surprised at how much love you can actually have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, it's so far beyond us to even understand how much you love us. Father, our love tends to be selfish and self-centered. We run life like a business looking at pros and cons. Where you said there's no benefit to you, but you sent Jesus to die for us. And Father, we are thankful for your gift of salvation. We cannot earn it. We can't measure up, but you gave it to us anyway. Thank you that you did not condemn us, but you came to die for us. 
Father, I pray for each one in here, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Father, we can't earn our way to you. All we can do is surrender. So, Father, I pray today, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today will be the day of surrender. And, Father, as believers, we want to be filled with your love. So help us to walk and be filled in your love every day. Lord, as we give these gifts, or financially as we give today, I pray that you'd bless each gift, that it would change us, Father, as we learn to give lovingly and and care for others through our gifts. I pray today as we give that you bless everything given. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're time of giving now. We have a great song to close the service. And uh, if you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. Thanks. Psalm 78, verse 1.